Good evening. How is everyone doing today? Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Zerlina Maxwell. I'm the director of progressive programming for Sirius XM Satellite Radio. I was formerly the director of progressive media for Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign, and tonight I will be your official MC. We've spent this entire day here at Wake Forest as a part of the Rethinking Community Conference, and it's been I think a staggering day in terms of the relevance of the conversations we've been having, complete with addressing some of the most important social and political issues of our time. I know that all day we've been looking forward to this particular panel and the issues it's likely to raise given what's going on in the world right now. So to get us all in the mood for a spirited conversation, I wanna introduce an artist that many of you may already know. Demi McCoy, also known as Demi Day, is a project coordinator for the Anna Julia Cooper Center here at Wake Forest. In her role, she supports a variety of externally facing research initiatives. Demi is also a hip hop artist, spoken word lyricist, Baptist preacher, a womanist theologian, and currently she lives right here in Winston-Salem. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Religion from Pepperdine University and a Master of Divinity right here in, from Wake Forest University's School of Divinity. She currently serves as an Associate Minister at Emmanuel Baptist Church led by Pastor John Mendez. She also works at Wake Forest University's program as the Program Coordinator for the School of Divinity. In 2017, she received the Addie Davis Award for Excellence in Preaching by Baptist Women in Ministry, as well as the Guthrie Prize for Exceptional Promise in Ministry from Wake Forest University Divinity, School of Divinity. Demi is here tonight to give us a word as only she can. So put your hands together for Demi. Wake Forest, how y'all doing? All right, so this is gonna require some crowd participation. So if we can repeat the hook, we're gonna drop the beat after we practice a couple of times. So let me hear you say, it's time to rethink community. It's time to rethink community. All right, let's do this. It's time to rethink community. It's time to rethink community. Let me hear y'all. It's time to rethink community. The road ahead is probably not the easy road. Hey. It's time to rethink community. Let me hear y'all. It's time to rethink community. It's time to rethink community. It's time to rethink community. Hey, the road ahead is probably not the easy road. I've been wrestling with freedom ever since I flee the south and all my friends been getting mad. Tell me what that beef about immune cow disease illness surrounding me. It's like a bell to be an anecdotal wave amongst the crowd to see and I can see the ways in which my God has been allowing me to drown in the social of life. Put my hope in this mic. I'm out here floating on the rhymes that I write. Richard Parker like I had a tiger flow. You gon' hear me roar from the depth of my heart and soul. I'm screaming from down below, trying to let them know where the royal live dwelling in Bring up the loyal kids. The oratory is different from most. Why would I boast? I rap from an inferior coast. And they don't know how much the city lacked. The heart it takes to get it back. It's got me out here changing, rearranging my goals. So, Wake Forest, let me hear you. Hey, it's time to rethink community. Let's go. Hey, it's time to rethink community. Hey, hey, it's time to rethink community. We talking change, and we probably talking unity. So, hey, it's time to rethink community. Give it up if you're ready for Melissa Harris Perry. Give it up if you're ready for Dave Zyron. Give it up if you're ready to rethink community. Yeah. Hey, it's time to rethink community. Once again, I go by the name of Demi Day. Let's rethink community.
Let's give another round of applause to Demi. I think that all put us in the right headspace for this conversation for sure. And now is the time where I want to introduce one of the co-sponsors of the Rethinking Community Conference, faculty director of the Pro Humanitate Institute and Maya Angelou Presidential Chair, Melissa Harris-Perry. So I know we are in a mindset now. We're ready. We're ready to rethink community. We've been doing it all day. I want to begin by saying again thank you to everyone who has been with us all day in the academic conference. We have a lot of work to do tonight. Hey, that's my people. Yes, we have folks here. I always love being here. I love being here at Waite Chapel, and that's where I want to begin, is in Waite Chapel because Wait Chapel is the place where we come, where we find ourselves in moments like this. Wait Chapel is, of course, the location where we speak across difference. 1988, right here, Wait Chapel, presidential debate. I wonder if the young folks know. George H.W. Bush, Bush and Michael Dukakis, right here, speaking across difference. 13 years later, right here, Wade Chapel, Vice President Al Gore and George W. Bush, right here, Wade Chapel. That happened here, talking across difference. I mean, not to find agreement, I mean, to debate each other, but right here. And wait, chapel. And then after Dylan Roof murdered worshipers in Charleston, we came together in Wait Chapel to talk about the Confederate flag and Southern identity and what it meant. And then just, just last month, we came together again in Wade Chapel to talk about Charlottesville and white supremacy and college campuses and what that meant. It seems like Wade Chapel is where we come when the big things happen and we need to rethink community. It draws us. I mean, maybe because it's such a big structure and it feels like the whole campus is sort of coming into these doors, but this is where we come to light a candle, to break bread together, to argue, to fight, but we come here. <laughs> Sometimes to do relatively extraordinary work of democracy, not because it is easy, but because it's worth it. So we find ourselves here again in Wade Chapel, this time to talk about sport. And here's what I want to ask us. What is it we think we are doing when we're doing sport? This was a question that came up in our first day, in our very first day of Rethinking Community. What is it we think we're doing when we're playing sport, when we're signing our kids up for sport, when we're participating in sport? I actually think we have a probably pretty romantic version and vision of sport. We think that we are learning about teamwork and excellence and opportunity and victory and sportsmanship. But more than anything else, we think sport is about participation. Get in there and be part of it, kids. Go to practice, participate. The reality is that actually participation in sport is stratified, stratified in all the ways that you would expect participation to always be stratified. Class, opportunity. <laughs> Not only that, our attitude about it is stratified. Don't give everybody a trophy, that'll screw them up. Turns out to be a partisan attitude. Democrats, give all the kids a trophy. Republicans, don't give them dang kids a trophy. 
But it also turns out that sport is wrapped up in our national identity. Olympics happen in the same year as presidential elections. Summer Olympics, just on the eve of our presidential elections. Do you remember 2016, just on the eve of our presidential election? Do you remember what the Summer Olympics looked like? Can you remember what the Summer Olympics looked like? Can you remember what America looked like? Can you remember who we were cheering for? Who was representing America in the summer of 2016, just on the eve before we cast our ballots? It was kind of an amazing moment, those last months of the Obama administration. But what else does it mean if you're on the team, Team America, and you're a participant, you've been taught to participate, you're on the team, you're a young person of color. What else has it meant to be on the team right now in America if you're a young person of color? What has it meant to be on the team? What has it meant to be on the team? if you're a young person in America right now. Do you remember what the summer looked like? Do you remember what the summer looked like? So then what does sport teach us about that? What is it we think we're doing when we sign our kids up for sport? Teamwork. Participation, victory. What do we think it has taught us about participating? How would we participate? We've taught our kids to participate on the team. We've taught them to stand up for their teammates. If we're on the team, how do we stand up for our teammates? If we're part of Team America, how do we stand up? What does standing up look like? Who's on your team? What does it look like to stand up? I just love that the cheerleaders got all the way information. I'm sorry. You see, these athletes tell us a story of participation. Not just with their bodies. They tell us what they're doing. They are not mad about the national anthem and they are not mad about the flag. They are telling us that their sport has taught them to stand up for their teammates. And these stories have origins. They don't come out of nowhere. They have histories. And they have a present. and they have consequences. So let's just go ahead and dig on into this. All right, this is your panel. Folks, my friend, my colleague, and somebody who writes and thinks about sport in America like nobody else, Dave Zirin, political sports writer for The Nation. Dave, come on out. Dr. John Carlos of USA Track and Field. You, of course, know John Carlos because he stood on that podium in 1968. Yep, yep, go for it, Dave. <laughs> Mahmoud Abdul Rauf. Former NBA player, he is a activist, a speaker. A thinker, 
and Ibtihaj Mohammed, world champion and Olympic bronze medalist, the first Muslim woman to represent the USA in international competition. This is your panel. Dave, take it away. Okay. How's everybody doing? Excellent, excellent. Um, first of all, I apologize for that poster. I'll just start with that. Like, that my face was so big. That's disturbing. Um, and second, before we start asking these questions and getting some answers and then turning it over to you, I just want to say a quick note about syntax. Uh, we will not be talking about anthem protests tonight. And that's because calling them anthem protests is the language of Donald Trump. These are protests against racial inequality and police violence that are being practiced during the anthem. And there's a huge difference there. So just so that's clear. And the second thing I wanted to say is, you know, we do this thing on my son's birthday where we call it dessert first where his birthday dinner, he gets to eat dessert first. And I'm gonna start the questions in here with dessert first, which means the question that's on my mind, the question that's on your mind, the question of this moment. And I'll start with Dr. John Carlos here and work my way down the line. And that question is just, is the one that I think's on all of our minds. And that's, Dr. John, if you could talk please about your feelings of seeing this new generation of athletes take up a fight and also use a lot of the same symbology and that space during the anthem to raise these issues of racial inequality and police violence. What is that like, sir? Well, it's a very good question. Well, first of all, I'd like to say it's, it's very refreshing for me to see all these young individuals uh, make the statements that they're making today. 50 years ago, uh, roughly 49 years ago, uh, people asked me after we did the demonstration in Mexico City, what do you think you're doing? What do you think you accomplished? Do you know what's going to happen to you? I said, well, you seem like you think I'm a bad guy. You're terrible. I said, well, if you think that I'm bad, wait for the next generation. <laughs> well, here we are 49 years later, the next generation, generation is checked in. So when I see these guys, it kind of make me think to myself, wow, I didn't know at that particular time that I was a gardener or a horticulturer and I planted seeds and nurtured the earth and watered it. And now this beautiful tree is there. And all of these individuals that I see throughout the United States, not just merely in athletics, but in the arts, in the business world, high school, college, they're the fruits of my labor. So I feel very refreshed and invigorated to know that the fight is going to warm up because we're going to squash this thing called prejudice and bias as best we can. Mm. So Mahmoud Abdul Raouf, first of all, great to see you. Just, just I'm going to say this to everybody, just so folks know, it's like I, I would not be a sports and politics writer. Like I would. I don't know what I'd be right now if it wasn't for Mahmoud Abdul Rauf. When he took his stance in 1996 during the anthem, I was a college student, and that was a life-changing pivot for me. So I guess I'll take this opportunity just first just to say thank you, thank you. Mahmoud Abdul Rauf. Thank you for being a pivot in my life. And now my question, though, is the same for you, because it's like you did this in the mid-'90s, and now it's 2017. And not only are you seeing this incredibly, and you were, you were so alone when you did it, and now you're seeing so many people do it. What are your thoughts when you see this new generation? Uh, well, I agree with John Carlos. Uh, it's definitely refreshing. Uh, we spoke about this earlier at the same time that uh, it's unprecedented, you know, what you're seeing now with the amount of athletes from all cross sections of sports, uh, female, male, just, you know, uh, taking a, taking a stand, making a position. Um, but, but to me, they're, they're symbolizing uh, the concept, and I talk about this a lot, of Ubuntu. You know, um, the story of this anthropologist creating this game among children and putting this fruit in a basket at the end and saying whoever can get to it 
can have it all to themselves as individuals, but they all joined hands together. And when they went, ran to the tree, the, uh, the anthropologist were, was surprised. He said, why did you do that? They said, Ubuntu. They said, how can one be happy when the rest of us are sad? That this is a psychology among African tribes that I am because we are. So to me, that they're representing this, this, this concept that this is bigger than them. Mm. You know, and, and it's just really refreshing to see. Wow. And, and Ibtahaj, you as an Olympian, this is your generation of athletes doing this work and you're part of a, a new organization which I think we'll talk about later called Athletes for Impact that's trying to build something long lasting to support these kinds of struggles. But what, what are your thoughts when, when you see like these NFL players and many others of course from the high school level on doing these or taking sports and treating sports as a political space? Um, I know for myself, uh within my sport, and I'm, I'm from a very small sport, right, when we, in, in comparison to like NFL or NBA. Go on. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was always told as an athlete that um, my voice, uh, there wasn't a space for my voice within sport. So there was a time uh, before the Olympics where I would tweet or I would, you know, post about um, a social issue that concerned me, and I was told that I had to delete it because it wasn't, um, it didn't reflect, you know, my national governing body in the way that they wanted to be represented. Mm. So I felt like I was almost being bullied into not using my voice. And um, when I qualified for the Olympics, I was like very fortunate to find a management company that encouraged me to find my voice. And I'll never forget my agent saying to me, and my agent is this half Japanese, half white woman, but um, very, very socially conscious. And she said to me, if you don't use your voice to speak up for people who look like you, who's going to do it? And I'm like, man, that's, that's what I've been waiting to hear. I was almost like chomping at the bit, um, waiting for really just someone to say and encourage me to do it. And um, I will say that having the desire to do so as an athlete and using your platform wouldn't, wouldn't be possible without athletes like Mahmoud or um, Dr. John Carlos. And I was telling um, John in the back that I had a poster of him on like this famous poster. Oh, that's not the poster. That's me. But uh, <laughs> I had this famous poster of him. Um, I, like that was the first thing I did when I got to campus. Um, when I, I went to Duke, when I got there, it was the first thing I did was buy this, this poster. And I feel like it was a rite of passage for all the black kids on campus. Everybody had this poster. You had mouth, you had you had, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you had Muhammad Ali, and you had uh, this very profound moment um, on the podium in the 68 games. And having, having athletes lead the way and show us um, what it's like to not just jeopardize your own safety and your own livelihood and that of your family, but even your own financial, your own financial wealth for the benefit of, of others, that's what life is about. It's not about... Um, it's not about money. It's about um, leaving the world a better place than, than, um, than we have now. Mm. Now, as we're staying in the present before we go in the past, I gotta ask the follow-up question, which is all the panelists spoke very positively about seeing these athletes model social justice as athletes and politicizing the field of play. We have a president of the United States who has chosen to demonize these athletes, who has chosen to make this in a na into a national issue, who has tweeted more about the NFL and their lack of patriotism than he has tweeted about Puerto Rico, for example. Now, I wanna ask you guys your thoughts about the president's response to this and what it says about this country right now. Just a light question, John. Well, the president uses this as a, a tool to uh, keep himself in the spotlight. Now, he talks about these guys are disrespecting the flag. We all know that it wasn't about the flag. Mr. Kaepernick used the flag as I used the podium in Mexico City. Where else can he get the attention of the world other than to do it at the National Anthem? And had I done it anywhere else, any track meet in Europe, Asia, or in front of the Apollo Theater, I would have never gotten the attention and reached out to the far ends of the earth, 
making a statement. So the president does this in terms of trying to sway public opinion. Oh, they're unpatriotic. You know, I was on a show a week or so ago, and, and my question to the president was, I said, uh, Mr. President, I remember when uh, I was watching you run your campaign, and before you decided to run, you chose to take my president and said that he was an American citizen. And you requested to see his birth certificate. You pushed it for eight months or more. I said, I would like to see right now, here and now, John Carlos as an American citizen, I'd like to see your father's discharge papers from the military. I'd like to see your discharge papers from the military or your son's discharge papers from the military. I noticed I didn't get a tweet the next day based on the fact that they never served in the military. And I had to make it clear also that those soldiers that he's talking about, they put their lives on the line to give Mr. Kaepernick and any individual that decides to take a knee or raise their fist to the sky the First Amendment right, the freedom of speech and expression. Now, he'd tell them that they're wrong in doing what he's doing. He want to take their First Amendment rights away, but yet and still he can get up and call them sons of bees. And America's not offended by that. So there is a quick and a solid divide in this country about how people of color see certain things and then other people on the other side of the aisle are so narrow-minded that they will not release their minds enough to try and weigh this through their minds. They're just being led like the critics say, Mr. Trump is a great man. Follow him. Well, I'm here to tell you that there's a lot more people in the world that understand what these individuals are doing. And I think people such as those that's here on this stage we anticipate letting the world know that we're gonna open your minds as, as, as far and as wide as we can for you to be critics of this government for yourselves. Mm. See. See. Malcolm, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well at, about the organized backlash, but also isn't it a remarkable thing though that given Trump's focus on this and given his incredible financial connections to NFL franchise owners, that these NFL owners have still, people might have seen this last week, had to give back and meet with the players and actually do things like commit money to social justice initiatives that players were involved in. I mean, isn't that kind of, and they didn't have any rule changes that would abridge their First Amendment rights. I mean, isn't that kind of a remarkable statement about the power of protest and solidarity that these athletes have shown? Uh, no question, I was just thinking the same thing. Um, the fact that they have been consistent and relentless in, in protesting and haven't wavered. Um, this is, uh, this is what, what can be produced. Mm -hmm. uh, this is how changes are, uh, are brought about. I just think it is, is a, his statement was just, as they say, very unpresidential. Uh, I think he's operating, me personally, on a high level of, of ignorance and arrogance, and it's sad, um, you know, trying to force people, and, and to make this an issue of the flag as you said before, and to deflect from the original reason why. Um, but I think people are, you know, you can see one thing on the media, but in the streets, I think mm -hmm. people really know what's happening. But it's not always gonna be told when you see it mainstream media. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's just making himself look more foolish day by day with these mm -hmm. statements. But it's scary, it's, it's just scary that this type of person can, can get on there on his soapbox and and mention these things, and as he said, mentioning the, the, the sons of a bees, I got immediately offended because, you know, I'm looking at on the street, mm -hmm. you know, you calling also by extension the mothers mm -hmm. as well as the parents mm -hmm. this offensive name. And I mean, what gives you the right to do that? And uh, so, I mean, I, that's, that's where I went when he said that. Mm. I mean, you know, on the street, I mean, really, those are fighting words. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I believe, I believe the, the Chris Paul tweet was, let him say it to one of their faces. And really putting it that directly. Now, if I have the same question to you, and I mean, especially like as, you know, someone as an Olympian, like, like what has it been like to see the president of this country respond to people exercising their rights in this way? And what, what, is, your, what is your critique of that? 
Um, I don't know if you guys all saw the press conference um, where I think he, when he w was in Puerto Rico and I think they were just with some, um, I don't know w what exactly these people's positions were, but when um, he, he turned to the guy next to him and he says, well, you know, Katrina was far worse. You know, thousands of people died in Katrina. And how many people died? A dozen or so. Uh, yeah, like, consider yourself lucky you know, because we had thousands die in Katrina. And then at the end, he starts th chucking paper towels at people like footballs. And I'm like, what world are we living in, right? Mm -hmm. Where we have someone who behaves in such a manner, it's, it's become a, like a norm. A lot of people don't know that this happened, number one, but then also it's just like, yeah, well, you know, that's a president. And um, it's scary that we live in this moment. I was I'm telling, I spoke with the Muslim, Stud Muslim Student Association earlier, and I was telling them as, um, <laughs> As a Muslim woman, for me, this has been the most difficult time um, to just exist. I've never felt so much discrimination on a daily basis from people. And mm -hmm. that's saying a lot as an African American, right? Because we experience microaggressions every day. But for whatever reason, it's just different. I feel like people are very confident to discriminate and to be mean and um, have uh, have these negative interactions, um, which to be honest, I'm always very shocked and perplexed by because it's not a norm for me to start my day off um, with this negative energy. But um, it's becoming a part of my daily existence as a Muslim woman in this country. And it's disheartening that, you know, we have our commander in chief be someone who is so like far gone um, and is on, you know, a boat to the land of ignorance that, mm. I mean, I, it's, it's hard to fathom that this is the world we live in. And I know that we, we tell each other that we have to, you know, keep moving forward, but it's hard when you feel like we're taking steps back every day. Mm -hmm. um, if someone would have told me 10 or 15 years ago that it would be harder to be a black woman, it would be harder to be a Muslim woman, like, you know, 15 years from now, I. I would say no way, right? Mm -hmm. um, and this is this is coming after having two terms of an African American president. I never imagined we would be in this space. Mm. It's like uh, another sports person, Greg Popovich, said this past week, and I see a lot of nodding heads. But unfit for the office, and then he went through it. He said emotionally, intellectually, and psychologically, unfit for the office, and we get evidence of that every day. And a tweet that I thought was very wise. Someone said, after Trump did this morning tweet thing that he usually does, I guess, in the bathroom, someone tweeted, 7.30 a.m., already exhausted. And that's that feeling. And I also think that's why so many people have invested so much, I don't know, heart of, and so much of themselves in these football players who've been protesting. Because in this time where I think a lot of us feel very lost, here's this visible dissent on the highest possible stage. And so for so many people who aren't football fans, it means so much to see these guys succeed because it's, it's, it feels hard out there on the daily basis. And it's like, hey, wait, these folks are fighting, so maybe we can fight too. And one of the things that has been, oh. Yeah, let me just add something. Yeah, please. You know, when you sit back and you, and you look at what's, what's taking place, uh, it kind of makes me go back in time. And, and I think about Frederick Douglass, in, in, in terms of his work as an abolitionist. And I think about his partner, John Brown. You sit back and you say, why is it America doesn't mention John Brown in its history anywhere? And then I thought about Peter Norman that was in the Olympics with me. Why did you not hear about Peter Norman for almost 49 years? Then you think about the NFL white players that's out there that's lending support to these black players, why is it that you don't hear about them as well? Because they want you to think that white folks really don't give a hoot about equality and justice and freedom for all people in the United States or on this planet. So, you know, we as human beings, we have to foster the fact that blacks are not alone in this quest for equality for everyone. White people out there, we have white people in this audience right now because they're concerned about the complexity of this situation in society today. 
but we can no longer let them paint the picture the way they want it painted. You know, you might think because you're sitting out there and we're sitting up here that we're the ones that are supposed to turn up the volume. You have the same opportunity to turn up the volume when you are in that situation. I don't care whether it's at work or whether it's at the baseball field or at the grocery store. If you see something wrong, it's your responsibility to turn up the volume. And you'd be surprised as to who will stand behind you and say, I got your back. Mm -hmm. And you don't look around until after it's said and done, you look back and say, wow, hit this guy or this woman don't even look like me but they made me feel comfortable to know that they was on the same track as me. So remember guys, this is not our fight. This is our fight, okay? Capital O. There you go. Mm. And one of, the, one of the things about this fight that's, that's been such an education I think for so many, or I should say so many who've been willing to listen and not just demonize these players, is that they give these incredibly beautiful explanations for what's going through their mind when they're taking that knee. You know, and they think about their family, they think about people who might have been in the military and their family and what they came home to after they were in the military. They think about people they knew who were hurt by the police in this country, people they were supposed to trust. They have these stories about what goes through their mind because it's such an intense experience to put yourself out there like that. So, John, I'm going to start with you. Actually, I'll end with you, John. I'll go to Mahmoud first. Um, and if you could talk a little bit, like when you were standing out there during the anthem, I mean, can you believe that this, I mean, this drove white people crazy in the 1990s? I'm, I'm just, I mean, <laughs> the 90s were a trip. This drove people crazy. You know, yeah. <laughs> white people just wanted to watch Friends. And, <laughs> and, and then all of a sudden, and, and Full House. And then the next, and then the next thing you know, you've got this basketball player with his doing this. And um, Mahmoud, I mean, I, I was hoping maybe you could explain about first what your motivations were for even doing it, and then also what was riding through your head as you were doing it. Man, we don't, uh, I'll try to keep it short, but let me, let me just say something about what John Carlos said earlier. Um, and, and the same thing happened to me when I took the stand that I took there's this, uh, there's this perception oftentimes that it's just, in, in, in this case, it's just a black issue. Black people are just concerned. They're not white people that are equally concerned about what's happening. Well, when I, was, when I did what I did, they try to make it uh, often, often seems like a Muslim issue. Yes. Right? Not, you know, and I was, I was literally thinking globally. Um, but there were so many, because now you have social media. Right, you can't really control the narrative the way you did then. But I had so many uh, letters coming in from people who were atheists, people who were Jewish, people who were Christian, uh, white, black, Native American, saying that they were very, of course you had the, the negative mail, but you had a lot of people that were very supportive saying we're with you, we stand for, but those voices were silent, you, you didn't hear those. Now it's a little different. Um, so, uh, and, 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 and for me, speaking about the motivation, um, it all started for me in college with the autobiography of Malcolm, just reading his book, how articulate he was, how courageous he was. I wasn't that type of person. And I knew that I had to make changes in my life at some point. I didn't know how it was gonna come about. And his book influenced me to look into Islam and I began to follow it. And I began to read more and in my reading, uh, I came across a lot of different authors, the Noam Chomsky's, Gore Vidal's, uh, Randall Robinson's, Amos N. Wilson's, and I'm just reading everything I can get my hand on, and I'm coming across stuff that I'd never, Aaron Daddy Roy's, that I'd never heard before. And then I started to feel like I'd been cheated. Mm -hmm. You know, like, uh, you know, somebody pulled the sheet over my head, and, and there's information that if I would have known it as a young man, the difference that it could have made, and so I can't get those years back. So as I'm reading this, I knew that, you know, at the same time, as they say, to whom much is given, much is required. You know, when you get knowledge, at some point, and I saw that, you know, I understand that there was a process that as I began to read, at some point you want to share it. And then as you begin to share it, you see that a lot of people think the way you think on a lot of different issues, and they're challenging you. Then what happens, the next stage is you develop, you develop 
your confidence. And then that confidence turns into courage. You say, I got to do something. And so for me, uh, this is how, this, these are the things that motivated me. And I eventually had to just take those steps. And as we talked earlier, sometimes we, we sit and we say, well, wait until I get, it's like students in college. Well, I'm going to go four or five, whatever years. Then after that, I'm going to go get a job. Uh, or I want to get all the information I can, then I'm going to move on it. Well, that almost assures you you're not going to move because you're never going to know everything. So my thing is whatever I know or think I know, let me move on it, and God will show me the rest. Yeah. And so, uh, and something else that was said, and I'm going to end with this, is that that sticks with me day to day is Erin Dottie Roy, and I say this all the time. She has a quote that I love. She said, and I started thinking about it, once you see something, you can't unsee it. To be silent, to say nothing, is just as political an act as speaking out. Either way, you're accountable. So our silence, we see things all the time. Everybody up in here, and we know that it's wrong. And okay, we're not all going fight to the, fight the same. you know. But there is something that we can do. But being silent about it, I said, well, shoot, if being silent is going to make me just as accountable, I might as well go for broke. Mm -hmm. And so this is the position that I took, and these are the things that, some of the things that influenced me. Man. I'm having a little surreal moment because when I do talks about sports and politics by myself, I always quote, and now you don't know this, Mahmoud, but I always quote you quoting Arundhati Roy. I, I Which, love her. I know, right? It's some Inception <laughs> style public speaking. And then somewhere there's some student quoting me, quoting my, all right, forget it. It's too much. Uh, but, but if that's, same question to you because I, I can't imagine it wasn't profoundly emotional given your trailblazing status, being at Rio, getting, the, not just being there, that was historic enough, but then also meddling. And then there you are, the anthem is playing. What, what was going through your mind at that moment? Um, first, let me say, like you said, for me, qualifying was like everything. Um, in my family, everyone knew that we couldn't talk about the Olympics. This is prior even to the qualification, uh, because for me, never having seen um, a Muslim woman on Team USA on the Olympic level, never having seen a woman of color on the United States uh, women's saber team, it was almost like um, it was almost like. It couldn't happen, right? I know that there was a possibility I, I would qualify, a possibility I wouldn't qualify, but for me, um, if I just uh, put my head down and I worked really hard, um, I didn't have to think about anything about the Olympics. So that wasn't really even, uh, I guess, part of my thought process. And in my house, you couldn't talk about it at all. Um, but when I qualified, I uh, and like the the angry hate tweets started coming in. Like, of course, the the tweets of uh, uh, support, but also a lot of the messages I would get, the death threats I would get, which people don't know, um, that's when I realized that that moment of qualifying as the first Muslim woman on Team USA was almost bigger than myself, right? Mm -hmm. Because it immediately kind of flipped the narrative on its head, um, this narrative that we've kind of been force fed of who a Muslim woman is. Like mm -hmm. in our mind, when we think of who the Muslim woman is, she's Arab. She wears all black, she doesn't talk, she's oppressed, she's from, you know, the Middle East. And mm -hmm. here I am, like, you know, this American woman uh, who's black, who doesn't speak Arabic, um, who, you know, is very vocal and verbal and participates in sports. And it just immediately challenged everything um, of what we, I think, mm -hmm. as a global community, think of Muslim women. And um, when I get to the games, I'm so excited to be there. I remember I. In my individual match, I, I lost my second match um, in the round of 16. And that's when like the trolling was almost at its worst. Cause it's like, I told you she would amount to nothing. And like people are so, like people love to see you fall. They like love it. And little did they know I was so excited to be at the Olympics. I was like, I lost, this is so exciting, right? <laughs> um, but you know, a few days later, thank God, won a medal with my team and um, like the hate tweets kind of ceased because again, people don't want to see you win. But uh, to, to bring home with a medal was definitely not something that I went into the Olympic Games expecting. I feel very thankful to be in this position and have this moment happen in my life. But I also feel like it's this profound moment for, um, for Muslim women in a sense that it, it shows 
Muslim girls and non-Muslim girls. It shows girls in general or little boys or whoever who've ever been told no at any point in their life. I remember being a kid and being told that I shouldn't fence because I was black, right? That I should try basketball instead. Or, um, you know, I was Muslim and Muslim girls don't play sports. So I remember all these different moments as a kid where I was told no. Um, and that, I felt like that medal was, is, is for, was for that 12 year old me, right? When I was a kid and, and really is for anyone in general who's ever been told no, like this is, I think a defining moment or was a defining moment and to show that you literally can have anything that you want regardless of what these naysayers um, may have to say and try to like dictate and change your journey just by um, being negative and, and throwing obstacles in your path. It's really about uh, hard work and I remember even before I went to the Olympics, I, I think I went to a talk that Mahmoud had given and to hear his story, I mean, if you guys ever have the opportunity to hear him tell his story um, and his process and, and working hard, that even changed the way that I trained as an athlete. Um, I realized, man, I'm not working hard enough. I will never make oh. NBA dollars in my life, but I was like, I am not working hard enough. I need to work a little bit harder. But I feel like having, um, having the opportunity to hear stories from other athletes and um, to, to really learn and gauge even how hard or not hard you're working has helped, um, has helped really uh, project my career. Mm. Wow, see, Mahmoud with the work ethic, John has stories of sitting in the stands eating french fries and popcorn yeah. and then just saying, oh, I guess I gotta go win a race yeah. and going down, <laughs> putting, on, putting on the cool shades. Yeah, if only it were, it were that easy, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know it's true too. <laughs> And, but, but John, same question to you, and I know this might be the question that you've gotten more than any other over the last 49 years, but what was going through your mind as you raised your fist on that metal stand in Mexico City? Well, the first thing that went through my mind was vision that I had when I was seven years old. Uh, the same picture that took place that day, I saw in a vision. As a, as a young kid, seven years old, in Lenox Avenue, New York, I was in a forum. I didn't know what a stadium was. I didn't know what athletics was. I was standing on a box. I was by myself, standing on a box, and all the people in the audience were just yippee ki yay and as I said, they were so excited. And it took a minute for me to realize that they must be excited about something that I did, because God never showed me what I did. But when it dawned on me that they were applauding for me, and I'm right-handed, and I always tell people I've knocked a lot of guys out with this. <laughs> but in this vision, I'm going to wave to the people with my left hand. And you know, as a little kid, you know, you wouldn't wave as high as you can get your hand up. And just about where you see this picture, that's where my hand froze in time. Because it's like someone snapped a, their, their finger or hit a switch. And all the joy and happiness turned to anger and venom. And they started booing and they started hissing and throwing things and spitting, name calling. And I never forget, I, 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 I got through the division and we were going to dinner that night. We used to go to dinner about 5.30, 6 o'clock. And my father could see that I was traumatized and he said, Johnny, what's the matter? I said, Daddy, I was in a movie. He said, you was in a movie? I said, yeah. He said, well, what happened? I said, Daddy, they was happy about something I did. And then they got mad at me and they started throwing things at me and calling me names. And I remember my father brought me into his ribs and he was telling me, he said, son, nobody's gonna bother you. He said, my job is to love you, protect you, house you, feed you, and see that you get a good education. Nobody's gonna bother you. And I remember he looked over my head and he said to my mother, he said, Vi, it looked like God's got something special for this kid. We're gonna have to wait and see what it is. 15 years later, that exact same thing happened in that victory stand. So that's the first thing I thought of, that God chose me for this. But you know, you know, you want me to talk about that, but I just want to talk about the glove and the fist. You know, a lot of people actually say, well, what was with the glove and the fist? You know, and, and then they try and editorialize it like, black power, black power, you're like, we was gonna burn up America. But if anybody and everybody here, take your hand and just hold your hand up like that. All right, see how free that feel? That's a free, free, free flow. 
But take that hand and ball that hand up to a fist. See how solid and strong it is? Well, just imagine if all of us here had the same mindset, and we are here separate with this mindset. And someone says, you know, if we take that phone that the lady had there on the floor, and we can move that phone across the aisle. And Mark jumped down, he tried to move it, and he can't move it. Dave looked at him and said, man, you know, you didn't move it, man, because you didn't put your hips into it. Let me show you how to do it. And Dave jumped down, and he tried to do it. But in the process of them trying to do it, we realized collectively, if we unite ourselves and come together, we become a very powerful force. This is what the young players in the NFL or young actors and actresses in the arts, if they was to realize this, you know, when you sit back and you think about the NFL or the Olympic Committee or, or any corporate entity, you know, you have to look at your life in terms of you being that cow or direction, them being that cow. And they'll tell you, hey, behave yourself out there. I want you standing for that place. Don't you get down on one knee because I'm the cow that gives the milk. And you look at that and you say, yeah, well, I'm intimidated because a lot of people get intimidated when you hear that. But you have to think beyond that and say to yourself, say, well, you know, he's right. He is the cow that gives milk. But I'm the grass that the cow has to eat in order to give that milk. If there's no grass, there sure is no cow. So when you sit back and you think about it, if they just hold together, it's going to bring a lot of people to the table. And that's what this whole thing is about, bringing people to the table mm -hmm. to make them say, hey, man, I know you don't want to be here, but you're going to be here. Mm -hmm. Why are you going to be here? Because you stand to lose a lot of money if you don't come here. Mm -hmm. All we have to do is steadfast. Now remember, when I did my thing 49 years ago, I like to tell people, I didn't have $5 in my bank account. When Mr. Kaepernick did his thing, he had at least $5 million in his. <laughs> so as Sister said earlier, I mean, it's not about the money. It's about the principle. Right. It's about the principle. And we realize that in this principle, you have to say, I'm not doing this for me. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it for my offspring, for my kids and my kids' kids, because they ain't nothing going to change overnight. But I want to make sure the train is headed in the right direction before I leave here. Mm. Now, a lot of people think about why the Kaepernick do it. You know, I'm, I'm kind of like a crazy sort of guy. Most people don't think like I think. He did it because he was tired of black people and people of color being abused and, and murdered by law enforcement. Those individuals are supposed to protect you. But see, my attitude about them is, man, if they're going to do certain things trying to set a precedent to me by killing us, I have to set a precedent to them too. Not by getting a gun and saying I'm going to kill them, but by putting something in their brain. I can't beat them. If I get a gun, they got a cannon. If I get a cannon, they got a bazooka. If I get a bazooka, they got a bomb. So I can't beat them that way. But I can penetrate their brain. And when they come to me and put the chokehold on me, man, I tell them, I say, man, you made a big mistake. What do you mean I made a mistake? What do you mean he made a mistake? Man, he made a big mistake. Mm. I said, because he's trying to kill me, and I don't have no fear about death because I'm going to die one day anyway. But the mistake you made is that you made a drastic mistake by letting me see your face. Because when I die, wherever I go, I'm going to wait for you because I know you're coming. I don't want you to think that this is resolved because you took my life. I'm committed until God says, totally over. Why? Because I thought about my kids as a young man. I thought about my kids. What is going to happen to my kids if I'm here right now before God in the world and I'm going to sit back and allow this not just to go on in my neighborhood, but around the world and other people's neighborhoods. You know the greatest thing about track and field? That we had an opportunity to see the world. How can I see people suffering the same way I am and be concerned about me being an Olympic legend and me being the gold medal or the bronze medal? That ain't about nothing. You know, I was telling sister earlier, I said, you know, you, you, you go to the Olympic Games and, and a lot of guys get tricked. They all into the medals. But I'm off Atlantic Avenue. I wasn't into the metal. I was into that Brinks truck. 
Who's taking that money home? I wasn't getting none of it. My kids wasn't getting none of it. As I made a statement, what, what, how long ago they made that statement? Uh, right after the game, 49 years, I guess. Yeah. And the guy was talking about, you, you won the medal. And I said to him, I said, yeah, man, but the kids around my block can't eat gold medals. And their kids can't eat gold medals. And it still stands today. So if we don't step up now as a nation or a race called the human race, we're going to go down in fiery flames. Mm. Wow. So it wasn't well, about Mexico, uh, what I thought on the stand. It was about what I was projecting to society on the stand. Mm. Well, Mark moved. <laughs> After that, you okay, Bob? Oh, good. Hey, good. I gotta duck off. You gotta go to the party. Hey, hey, listen, guys, you have to forgive me. I got this thing called prostate issues, so I'm gonna have to make a, a party. <laughs> we're not, we're not all good. And can I ask one more question? Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. No, I got not, not, not to you, John. Down. It's okay. Oh, I wouldn't do man. that to you. Hey, you okay. can take this to the restroom and <laughs> oh, Lord. and answer. Oh, Lord. Yeah. Why take you it to the restroom? <laughs> um, he I, don't come back. Last two questions. Oh, yeah. I, I, I think right this back. is such an important question. I'm, I'm so glad I get to ask it before we go to the audience. Is I was at um, a rally in front of NFL headquarters for Colin Kaepernick in August. And it was one of the coolest rallies I've ever been at in my life. It was 2,000 people, loud, boisterous, and right on 50th and Park Avenue in New York City. It was a beautiful thing. And it was not people from 50th and Park Avenue who were at this rally. And one of the speakers was a, a, a woman about 80 years old, still active in her NAACP chapter. And she said, I'm out here because one of my great regrets is that I, was, I did not organize for Muhammad Ali in the 1960s. And I did not organize for Tommy Smith and John Carlos. Because we looked at those, we thought those protesting athletes, we thought it was cool. We thought it helped us. But we didn't realize that they needed our solidarity and that they needed our help. And that was a mistake that we made in the 60s. And I'll be damned if I repeat that mistake now that I get another chance. Mm. And she said, I've been, mm. waiting, I've been mm. waiting 50 years to get the chance to right that wrong. And you should have, like, you could have heard a pin drop on 50th and Park Avenue because she was like the cane and everything. It was unbelievable. And so I, I did want to ask you guys, like, like Mahmoud, I mean, you, you made this incredible act of public dissent at a time when the level of struggle in this country was really low in the mid-1990s. What kind of solidarity and support did you get at that time? And what kind of support did you get when you found yourself outside the league looking in because of your politics? Well, it, well, it definitely wasn't on the level of where it is now. <laughs> There's no question. But um, it, it was the support that I was getting was was more behind the scenes, uh, individuals here and there, but definitely not like organizations from what I can remember. But I, I wasn't even focused on that really, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because I mean I don't want to sound uh, hyper religious, but God is my support, mm -hmm. you know, regardless, and that's the way I move, and, and I believe that, uh, you know, moving that way for me. Uh, I'm always moving from a position of power anyway, because he's the most powerful, but I didn't have an overwhelming amount of support um, the way you see it now, but it would definitely have been beautiful to have that. It makes, it makes a huge difference to know that you have that, uh, that support coming your way. And that's why it's so great to end with, uh, with Ibtahaj with this question, uh, because Ibtahaj is part of a new organization called Athletes for Impact precisely so athletes going forward can have this kind of support. Like, Ibtaj, what, what's your vision for Athletes for Impact is my, my question. And also, I don't know if you knew this, but John Carlos is now the latest member of Athletes for Impact. He decided he wanted to join in. Welcome to the club. <laughs> um, well, I was also at that rally, uh, the Colin Kaepernick rally in front oh, of wow. NFL headquarters. And um, first of all, it was, I mean, I haven't been to that many rallies, but that was by far my favorite one. And it was interesting because you have all these, uh, all these people standing around there for Colin who's not there. Um, and then you also, by law, you have all these police officers there. So many police officers. So many police officers, so many like the police chiefs, like everybody's there, right? Everybody looks super tight, like not happy to be there. Like they don't really want to protect you, which is kind of scary. 
But um, I actually went to the rally with my dad, who is um, a former police officer. Uh, he's a retired drug detective out of Newark, uh, New Jersey. And um, it was just really interesting to me to see my dad in that space there to support um, Colin Kaepernick and um, his quest for uh, his quest for social justice and what he's doing, yeah. um, but also to see that kind of uh, that contrast in the police who are there, who again look very unhappy to be there, um, and my dad, who has, I think, in a sense, like the shared brotherhood because they're both police mm. officers, um, but at the same time, just I mean, and not to paint all of NYPD with a broad stroke, mm. but. Um, I don't know, I just felt like it was this very prolific moment to like be there, especially be there with my dad, uh, who's a retired police officer. But um, what I like about athlete, athlete for Impact, I feel like it was almost born out of a necessity in a sense that we're kind of in this moment where um, you do have athletes on a larger scale using their platform uh, for social change, um, but also it, I mean, it doesn't exist anywhere. So it's almost like we, we have to yes. have it. It has to, we need, I think, an organization that speaks to these issues in particular. And I also believe that it will encourage more athletes, not just professional athletes, but also on like the local high school collegiate level to um, speak out against social issues that I know happen on this campus that definitely happened at Duke when I was there and that continue to happen on campuses around the country. So um, I look forward to the work that we will do, uh, God willing, in the near future. And I'm hoping to get more prolific athletes like John Carlos and Mahmoud on board. Right on. Everybody, so, we round of applause for our panel. So Dave, as we were putting this panel together, you and I had a bunch of conversations back and forth about how we were going to um, structure it. And one of the conversations that we had was, am, do I get to answer some questions? You asking me. In other words, would I ask you some questions? And the answer is yes. I have a couple questions that I want to ask both to you and to the panel in general, because there's a few more things I'm going to take a little organizer of conference privilege to ask before I open it completely up to the audience. So here's one. Here we are, we're at Wake Forest University. It's a Division I ACC school, although ACC has no meaning anymore. I mean, I love Notre Dame, but my God, it's nowhere near the Atlantic or a coast. Mm -hmm. Here we go. You talked a lot about, particularly Ol Olympic athletes, because of the athletes we have here on the stage. We've talked about Kaepernick as a professional athlete taking a stand in this particular way. I am interested in the particular vulnerability that college athletes face. For me, the extraordinary courage of the Mizzou players, and this is really for everyone on the stage, but the extraordinary courage of the Mizzou players to move that student-based protest to a different level it just, whether you agree with what was happening on that campus or not, the reality is we would not be talking about Mizzou if it were not for the fact that the football team made a decision to do what we hadn't really ever seen in a contemporary era, and, in t and not like one or two or three, the team sat down. Dave, you and I have talked a lot about the NCAA. <laughs> How in the world did that happen? And what does that mean? And might we see that happen more as this sort of standing up for your teammates in part by sitting down or taking a knee mm -hmm. spreads not and becomes not just a, a question of what professional athletes are doing, but potentially also mm -hmm. college athletes. And if you could also maybe talk about it in the context of the labor um, movement among college athletes? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost about college athletes and revenue producing sports. We're really talking about football and, and men's basketball. And we're talking about sports that are dominated by the black athlete. And oh, by some coincidence, those are also the only big time sports where the athlete doesn't get paid. Which is quite a coincidence, isn't it? That 
sports dominated by black bodies and black labor are the ones where they are also the most exploited. And I, I said this on your show, Melissa, and it won me all sorts of nice fan mail. But like when you- uh, Yeah, when, I got great trolls. Yeah, w when you cut away all the niceties, what the NCAA is in terms of how it formally operates is that it is the organized theft of black wealth because it produces billions of dollars in wealth that does not go back into black communities and black homes. It goes into different places. That's, and so when you look at something like Jim Delaney, who's the commissioner of the Big Ten, uh, was granted himself with the approval of the school presidents a $20 million bonus last year. I mean, this is supposed to be an educator who's overseeing a nonprofit who basically gives himself a $20 million bonus. That $20 million should have gone into the homes of black families. And instead it went into one man's pocket. That's a, a fundamental problem with the NCAA. But briefly, like why Missouri happened, I can answer it like in, short, in like just two sentences. Like Missouri happened for the same reason why Colin Kaepernick took that knee. Colin Kaepernick didn't take a knee because it occurred to him to do so. He took a knee because Alton Sterling and Flando Castile were killed by police and those videos went viral and all sorts of people across the country were protesting and raging and crying and he decided, just like John Carlos said, he decided he needed to organize where he stood and where he could have the most impact. And it was the same with Missouri. It didn't start in a vacuum. If anything, a lot of the Missouri football players who I interviewed, they said that they had not themselves experienced racism on campus. But when they started listening to the black students who were not football players, including students who were involved in camp cities on campus, hunger strikes on campus. So one young man risked his life doing a hunger strike on that campus because of the deep racism that exists at the University of Missouri that the stories that are told by generations of students on that particular campus are harrowing, even by the state. Look, there's no such thing as a racism-free zone in this country, but at the same time, I think we can also say that there are spaces that are more racist than others. Like, I, I would rather hang out at a Chicago union meeting than at a Trump rally. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can find racism in both, but you can't say they are both equally racist, you know? And uh, uh, Missouri, because of very particular circumstances, is a particularly brutal place for the black student. And what happened also, this is important, like we're talking about the importance of black women in this struggle. It was black women who went to the football team and basically said, you guys are not stepping up when the rest of us on this campus are. And so you, at the, it was black women who led the football players to speak to the people in the, camp, in the tent cities and doing the hunger strikes. And that's when they said, that's when they showed the world that while black football players, college football players, are some of the most powerless laborers in this country, they are also some of the most powerful in this country. Because when they decided to not play for one week, the school president who was bragging about the fact just a week earlier that he would never relinquish his position in the face of these protesting ungrateful students, he was gone, just like that. That's the power, because they're so central to the economy of the modern university. John Carlos, if you will look behind you at the photograph that I have, you messed up my whole world when you told this story more carefully the last time that, that um, we were together. And I would hope that maybe you could share this story tonight as well. I've, I think like- um, Listen, I've told a lot of stories. I know, <laughs> sir. Yeah. And I'm almost afraid to let you tell another. Help me. Because you, you started going down Old Black Man Road I, it started happening, and I was like, "Oh Lord, we done gone all the way down." But just, but, said, but, but the story is so good. I'm gonna let you go on down that road again, sir, because it's a good story, sir. So here we go. I'm gonna ask you go on down that road, but just kind of try to bring it on back, bring it on back now. So here we go. Now I have looked at this. <laughs> I have looked at this photograph a million times. I think many of us have, but it was not until you told me the story that you all fought to have the third statue right. included at right. the African American History Museum, that you all would not allow that statue to be built. Can you tell us why? Well, Mr. Lonnie Bunch, uh, when he was a young individual that came out for the uh, 
2000, uh, not 2000, but uh, 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles. He was a young protege artist. And they gave him an assignment to uh, come to Los Angeles and create an exhibit of the black athletes. And he had no clue as to how he was gonna formulate it. He didn't know any athletes. And someone got a hold of me and said, look, I want you to meet this guy. So I go over to Exposition Park and I sit down, I listen to what his plight was. I said, all right, man, we fixed this up right away. And I'm gonna get the athletes for you. I'm gonna get the artifacts for you. I'm gonna tell you how you're supposed to do it, 50 boppy boom. And I, I do that all the time and I give it to him and I went on. I told him one thing, I said, when you do this exhibit, it's gonna be a great exhibit. I said, but promise me that you would take the exhibit and you would take it all around the country to all the high schools and make sure all the high school kids see it. Well, he promised me, but it never materialized. So he went on about his business. And then they caught me up here in Atlanta, Georgia, and a guy came to me, he said, uh, my name is Mr. Thomas, uh, and I represent the Smithsonian Institute, and we're building the Black History Museum, and, and I'm looking at him and say, yeah, yeah. Well, we would like to get your permission to build a statue of the demonstration. So I said, oh man, that'd be great. That's real fine. So when he says statue already, in my mind, I'm thinking about three characters in this exhibit. And then as time went on, I'm listening and listening and listening and tell me while well, they're getting it together. So I called Mr. Bunch again. I said, Mr. Bunch, I said, look, man, uh, my, my family and my friends getting a little anxious. You know, I, I haven't gotten any calls about, you know, when we going to come in. You're going to put us up at the hotel and the whole nine yards. And he said, well, John, we're still putting it together. You know, we're running slow. So I figured we on CP time. So then I said to him, I said, well, look, Mr. Mr. Bunch, when you put the three individuals up there, where will they be? And he said, well, John, it's not going to be three individuals. It's going to be two individuals. And I said to him, I said, no, Mr. Bunch, it's three individuals. Oh, well, we're not going to put Peter Norman up there. I said, well, you're not going to put John Carlos up there either. <laughs> oh, what do you mean you're not going to put? I said, listen, man, if this is a black history museum. How can we change history? How can we exclude Mr. Norman because he's a vital part? See, God sent Peter Norman there to give a message to society. Mm -hmm. The same message I gave you tonight about, hey, it ain't about your colors, it's about your heart and your spirit. So how are we going to take him out because he's not American? How are we going to take him out because he's not black? He did the deed. And if we're going to educate kids in this world, or adults for that matter in this world, we have to tell the truth. And if Mr. Norman is not there, you're not telling the truth. And if you're not going to tell the truth, you can't put me up there. So you go back to your sponsors, or you go back to your treasure chest and get the money to build his statue. And when you go there today, and the first person you see, because a lot of people tell me, say, man, that's a beautiful statue. And I ask him all the time, I say, well, what makes it beautiful? He said, man, because they got the three of you guys there. Now, in San Jose, when they built statues, they built some 25-foot statues at San Jose State, which was out of this world. And I had a guy call me, one of my classmates called me, and he said, John, he said, man, the statues are coming along fine, man. They got Tommy, he's erected already. They got you laid out on the table. They hooking you up. I said, well, what's happening with Peter? Oh, I didn't see any statue of Peter. What do you mean you didn't see no statue of Peter? I didn't see no statue of Peter. So I jumped in my car in LA and I drove on down to San Jose. So I go to the student body because the students were the one. It wasn't the administration of the school that raised the money to put those statues up. The young students, because they didn't know that Tommy Smith and John Carlson had gone to San Jose State. And they just happened to have us in one of the classes and they were discussing it and the, and the professor said, well, those guys, went to school here at San Jose. And they said, you mean they went to school here at San Jose and they have nothing of them, no, no mention of them whatsoever? And this young fella, he was the president of the Student Body Association. He went to a Hispanic guy that was in charge of the program. And just so happened, he was born October 16th in Mexico City. So they went to him and he told me, he said, well, let me tell you what you need to do. So they went and they, passed the legislation to be able to go hustle the money 
to put this statue up. So when I went to him and I said to him, well, what's happening? How come Peter's statue is not going up? They said, well, Mr. Collins, you know, Peter didn't go to San Jose State. I said, well, I don't have anything to do with it. They said, but greater than that, Mr. Collins, Peter didn't want his statue put up there. All right now, he said, Dad, my lip dropped. He didn't want his statue put up there. So I said, all right, I'll get back to y'all. So I get my car and I drive around and I go to the president's office. I told the president, I say, I say, listen, uh, Dr. Kesson. I said, Dr. Kesson, I need to make a call. He said, call where? I said, a long distance call. <laughs> I need to call Australia. I call Australia, Peter picks up the phone. And I said, Peter, I said, Pete. He said, who is this? I said, this is Carlos. And he goes to us, said, you blind me Americans, he put that British thing on, right? So I said to him, I said, Pete, am I understanding that you didn't want your statue there? And he looks at me, on the phone, he says, John, <laughs> he said, listen to me. He says, I didn't put my statue there not because I didn't want to be with you. He said, but I didn't put my fist to the sky. He said, I supported you guys putting your fist to the sky. He said, I want my place to be vacant. So anybody that comes from anywhere on planet Earth and come to San Jose State that want to lend support to what you guys are doing here, they can stand in my spot. So that raised him up like humongous in my mind. Understand? Because most individuals, their egos are so big, I am thou. Mm -hmm. You must put me up. So when they decided, when he decided that, I said, okay, Peter, I understand. So I hung up and then I went back to the student body and I told him, I said, all right, I got the picture. I said, but one thing you're gonna have to do anyway, you better put a plaque up and put a light pointing to his name and make sure that everybody understand that he belongs here, but he's sacrificing his opportunity to be here to give you opportunity. That's one thing that will always carry me in my mind and my heart and my spirit and the love that I have for this guy, Peter Norman. And because he's a true, he's a true, true mm -hmm. soldier of God. You know, I asked him, I said to him, I said, Peter, I said, do you believe in human rights? He said, of course, my mom and dad used to be human rights, uh, uh, Salvation Army workers all my life. I said, well, would you like to wear Olympic Project for Human Rights button? He started reaching for my button, I had to get back, man, you can't get this one, <laughs> but I'll get you one. And when I gave him that button, he was so proud for me to pin that button on him. Now, I know Peter didn't think that he would go through the turmoil that he's gone through, okay? He wore that button. Now, imagine now, South Africa, you know the deeds of South Africa. Well, South Africa and Australia, they were running parallel with that mentality. So the Aboriginal people were going through hell as much as people of color in the United States was going through. So he said, yeah, man, I would like to wear the button. But mind you now, when he went back to Australia, we parted the seas. I ain't seen Peter, and I didn't have time to be worried about Peter because I was trying to protect me and my family. We ducking and hiding because they come to whip up on me 24-7. Then they get tired of whipping up on me, they go across town, find Tommy Smith, and whip up on him. That's the only way I got a breather. That's the only way he got a breather, when they transferred back and forth, volley back and forth. But in Australia, Peter didn't have nobody to step in for him. He took a whipping 24-7, 365. It busted his heart. He left this world too soon, physically. He'll never leave spiritually. But when you sit back and think about it, when I went to his service and I sat up and looked at all the people, and they had about 3,000 people in this auditorium. And I looked at them and I looked at Peter's mother and I said to the people in the audience, I said, listen, I said, Peter Norman, I said, when they, and the guy that died, uh, Mr. Irwin, I think he was the animal king. He used to kiss alligators and you know, he died, the stingray killed him around the same time that Peter lost his life. I said, now, if you were going to honor Mr. Irwin as the animal king out of Australia, I said, you could never honor him and not honor one of the kings of humanity, which is Mr. Peter Norman. I said, for all of you people that's here today in this stadium to honor Peter, 
I say, I all those that came to the airport, when he came home to hold him high as he should have been held high, step forward so I can see you. I say, you're here now in his demise while he's gone to show tribute to him. Why didn't you show the tribute to him when he was alive? Everybody in the audience start crying. We ain't trying to make you cry. We just trying to bring you up and let you know you got to step up now, not tomorrow. Peter needed more people in Australia to have his back. We needed more people in 1968 to have our back. But you know, there's two things that I had going for me, and I'm sure Mr. Smith and Peter as well. We had God on our side, and we had the love of our families. Now, that's a short story. <laughs> um, We have some very special guests here in the front two rows. We have Carborough High School. They got a chance to come backstage in the green room just before we started. So who's going to get the first question? Um, oh, mm, mm, mm. Mm, no, she has a duke. I just can't do it. <laughs> so in school, we have been studying race extensively. And we ha were fortunate enough to meet with Bree Newsom, who uh, in Charleston climbed to top of the Confederate flagpole and took down the Confederate flag. And so when we were talking to her, she, she explained, well, when I was doing it, I wasn't thinking of myself as an activist. And I still don't think of myself as an activist. And so what I'm wondering is, do you think of yourselves as activists? And if so, what do you think the role of these strong activists is in our society? We'll start. Um, well, I mean, I, 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 can, I can see um, how that statement makes sense. I think to be black in America is to be an activist, to be Muslim in America is to be an activist, and to be a woman is to be an activist. So, um, yeah. Mm. Okay, despite the Duke, I'm gonna let you go next. Oh, wait, there's another, oh, I'm sorry. No. I mean, well, she I, answered it for everyone. She did. But I also thought Mahmoud answered that question earlier when he spoke about the Arundhati Roy quote. And it's this idea of like, once you see something, you can't unsee it. And then not doing something is actually making a political choice. And I think that that's, that's wisdom, you know, and that's worth, worth leaving here with. Okay, hi. Um, Hey. So the, the term racist tends to be thrown around a lot. I've noticed particular, like in, in my school, like we use that word a lot. Um, when you go further like into depth about what the definition actually means, it, it gets interesting, but I've never been called racist until I started expressing my love for the like black community and until I started involving myself in activism and, and until I started really saying, you know, like, I'm black and I'm proud, and I let everyone know that. And I noticed when Donald Trump was elected, I noticed that people felt more comfortable kind of saying, calling me racist or you know, telling me that it was wrong to express my love for the black community. And I was just wondering if, I know you said that you've experienced more, it, it's harder for you to be a Muslim woman now with him being in office than it has before, but do you think that him being elected really has given people that kind of leeway to just say how they really feel towards people of color and minorities, women? Uh, uh, definitely. And you know, when you are subject to discrimination, you never stop in the moment and say, excuse me, quick question. Do you not like me because I'm black or is it because I'm Muslim? Like you never stop to ask anyone. So for me, I never know unless someone is, um, unless they like explicitly say what their problem is, which they don't. Um, but I think to speak to your point about, um, you know, people's response, society's response to you loving yourself. I think that we live in a system that was built to, um, to almost like devalue ourselves as people of color, um, to not love our hair, to not love our skin, to not love, you know, our shape, to not love the way that we think, the way that we feel. So when you come to a point of growth in, in your journey through life and you learn to appreciate the very things that you've been told to hate from the time you're a kid, 
um, just by the things that we see, the things that we read um, in television, even on social media. Um, when we come to a point in our lives where we learn to love ourselves, um, that almost makes people who are racist, right, feel uncomfortable. It's like, oh shoot, does she like herself? That's not part of the plan, you know? We don't want you to love yourself. Um, so I, I love to hear that, just in that you've come to a point in your life, and you're so young. When I heard you guys speak in the back, and I know not everyone was, was in the room, but to hear you know, these young people, first of all, speak so eloquently. When I was your age, I don't, I don't even remember if I could tie my shoe straight, but um, I, I'm pretty sure I wasn't um, so socially conscious and so you know, awake as you guys are. So I love that about you guys. And I love to see the diversity. I don't know if this is in your entire class, but to see it so diverse, um, especially at a North Carolina high school, um, to me is very profound and it um, makes me happy to see. But again, I, I hear what you're saying in terms of coming to a point where you learn to appreciate yourself and almost receiving backlash. Like I have, if I post anything, like hashtag black girl magic, which is like every post, right? If I hashtag that, you will not believe the number of comments I get with white people deserve love too. And I'm like, what? <laughs> that's, not, like, I, that's, not what the, that's not what the hashtag meant, but okay. So, yeah. Mm. Are there other um, questions? Mm. Oh, yeah, I'll come back to you guys, I promise. I, I didn't want to say, say one thing to that. If I could, just I feel just this week in particular, I feel is very important. There's no question that I mean I really think Donald Trump is, is is a monstrous person in this White House. I believe that with all my heart. I believe as well that in this era of social media, one of the things that we I think we still haven't figured out how to deal with is that every time something awful happens, it gets immediately downloaded into our brains. It's like there is no break from the awful. I mean, think for yourself like what it would have been like if this kind of social media existed like in the 1960s or in the era when lynchings in this country happened two times out of every three days and think about like if not only did you heard about it or read about it but the images and the video the second it happened were just like downloaded into your mind I think it creates a tremendous amount of pressure on not just young people but all people who are tied in that way and but I think one of the dangers of it also about this moment in particular is sometimes we get it twisted and look at Donald Trump as if he is somehow exceptionally bad and that's very dangerous in terms of how we understand history because I'll tell you something I was pretty outraged this week to see so many liberal people praise George W. Bush for his speech against racism and it's just like, and, and I get even where that praise comes from because he stood up there and he said white supremacy is a blasphemy. And people are so, I think, desperate to hear any kind of common sense about this. Like someone with, who at least looks to have like a working cerebellum that is just like there's this almost gratitude. But I'm sitting there and, you know, and I'm thinking about the Iraq war. I'm thinking about mm -hmm. Hurricane Katrina. And I think so that when we ask, it's a helpful exercise to ask yourself, what would have happened if Twitter had existed during Hurricane Katrina? And we were getting live updates from people who were drowning in their homes because of racism and federal neglect, Dr like dying on rooftops. Like, and we were getting that by the thousands from the people of New Orleans and how that would affect what we think about George W. Bush, certainly, but also the, how that would have affected all of us psychologically. Uh, I think most people in general would like to see sports as an avenue of escapism for a few moments of the week. Uh, but what we've seen over the past 15 and 20 years is those moments have been moments of indoctrination. Uh, we get military flyovers. We have flags as big as the football field. So I think what upsets the powers that be the most is when uh, folks like Mahmoud Abdurrahouf, uh, Colin Kaepernick, take that moment and reclaim that moment and make their own stance instead of uh, being indoctrinated and feeling like you have to go along uh, with this big military industrial complex, um, police brutality, whatever they're pushing. And I think really that's what upsets the structure and the powers that be the most uh, because they know what they're, they've actually been indoctrinating us for the past 15 and 20 years. And most people just go along with it. <coughs> Did 
excuse me. If the Haji wrong for him, that might be you know, you probably. You, you're absolutely right. You know, it's, it's kind of hypnotic the way they put the big flag out there and bring the flag, the planes over. But you have to remember one thing. I don't care whether it's a football player or whether it's a, a jockey in a, in a race. When they take the uniform off, man, they're black people. It's just like going to buy a house. You know, you go up to buy a house and you three blocks away, they can see who you are. I could be five blocks away. When you're there, it says vacant. You just talked to them five minutes ago. I talked to them two minutes ago. Oh, it's vacant. Come on in. But they see me five blocks away. They know who I am. The police know who I am. They don't care about that I'm a superstar on Sunday. They don't care that I'm a movie star on Friday. All they see is a black person. And a lot of them don't show any respect towards that black person. And, and I wondered to myself sometimes, is it them or is it those that teach them? Because I've never seen the police department come say, let's sit down at the table and let's have some dialogue about whether we can do a better job training our soldiers, uh, training our uh, uh, police officers. And then when you sit back, let's do a research, and you see, think a lot of officers that they got, they went to the Deep South and got them. A lot of them grew up as young Klan members, young neo-Nazis. You know, years ago, I could pick and say, man, well, that's the KKK, that's the KKK, that's the KKK, because they had a brand, they had a hood. But they took their hood off. Because they took their hood off, they didn't disappear. They're still there. So when you sit back and say it's about the flag and them being upset, they're not upset about the flag. They're upset because black people were saying, man, we are tired. And we're no longer going to be your patsy. We're no longer going to accept what you've been putting down for us. When you sit back and say, what if I was to tell you, you say, man, we ain't going to never let you hear about George Washington. We ain't going to never let you hear about Abraham Lincoln. You ain't going to know nothing about Benjamin Franklin. You ain't, ain't going to know nothing about no white folks. All you're going to know is about me. And then one day you wake up and you realize what your history is. Would you be upset? Would you be upset that your kids don't know that they had done great things in this, in this country? Any person, I don't care who you are, would be offended when you find out your history. And you have a right, whether it take 50 years, 300 years, or 400 years, but when you realize that you've been done wrong, you're gonna step up to the plate one way or another, you're gonna make your statement known. Now, it's only a handful out there right now relative to society that say I have the gumption to get up and speak on these issues. Because there's so many black people out there that feel the same way that we feel. But you know what it is? It's that same fear factor. Your same fear factor that our ancestors had. But if you get out of line, we're going to take you in the back of the barn. We're going to whip you. And then when it got beyond whipping, if you get out of line, we're going to penalize you on the job. You get out of line, we ain't going to let you live in this neighborhood. So with so much held over them to the point where they say, man, I have to restrain myself because I have to feed my family. But now people are starting to say, man, it's not about restraining myself anymore. It's about making a specific statement to tell you, say, man, your time is up. Because I remember they used to always say, man, give us more time. Your day is coming. The same thing they told me, they told Harry Belafonte. But also I think it's important to note um, that everything that you see on Sunday, Monday or Thursday night on the NFL, right? That's all by design. This whole like, you know, act of patriotism for you to see, you know, this huge football size American flag and, you know, these salute to all the soldiers. There are billions of dollars put in place to make that happen. And it's, it's all like um, for monetary reasons. That didn't just happen just because, you know what I mean? This is, this is all, I don't know, it almost seems like an act in a way just to make money. Well, Let me just say this. I'll, I'll be short. It'll it, it be, real, be real short. Remember when you was kids and you used to go to the movies and see the Cowboys and Indian movies? And, 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 and when the cavalry used to come, they was in their stars and stripes, how everybody in the movies started applauding? That's the same thing they're building now. <laughs> 
Okay, so I have two questions. But first, um, Mrs. Muhammad, I just really want to thank you because last summer was like everything for me and my daughters because now I can tell them like you can do anything and they can believe it because the representation and representation is so important. Thank like, you. My three-year-old is a sword fighter. So now on to my questions. So in 1968 and 1996, what was it like for black people, like the climate amongst black people when you came home and for you when you were protesting, like? I know that you were praying, but like, what was it like amongst black people? Because now when people talk about John Carlos, they talk about the hero that John Carlos is, but what was it like then? And my second question is, what do you think about black American athletes who speak out against Kaepernick, like, you know, Ray Lewis? And may, may, I, may I edit your question slightly? Because I'd love to hear from Mahmoud also about what it was like there you go. in the black community. Thank you, Dave. Amen. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. There you go. Yes, right. I just okay. How was it? Uh, How did the black community receive you once you'd made your protest, and then also when you were out of the NBA? Uh, that's a good one. Um, it was a mixture. Um, of, of course, there were a lot in the community that that uh, stood by me. They felt what I was feeling. But then again, there were some that just disagreed with, with the stand altogether. Uh, they didn't feel that I should have uh, uh, taken that position for whatever reason. Um, trying to think of all the question again. Remind me what you just asked. <laughs> Oh yeah, you always have oh, those. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember. Uh, I can't remember his name. He played for the New Jersey Nets. Tall, light complexion guy. Uh, he ended up uh, going to prison. It was Jason Williams. There you go. Oh, he was very vocal and notorious. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, not to be like confused yeah, I with. I remember him vividly. Yeah, yeah. yeah not was, to be. Yeah. He was probably at that time the, 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 the Ray Lewis of today. Well, then God came in and now he's in jail, so. <laughs> well, he's out now. He's, he's out now, so yeah. he's, he's, he's free. But well, then, then he should apologize. Yeah, but, 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 uh, but you know, I just want to say something real quick. Uh, the risk that these guys have taken is, is enormous. Uh, and, and that anyone takes, r regardless of what, what your occupation is, because you all, you, pretty much you're committing career suicide. You know, you know that once you take a position like this, that there's a great chance that you're not coming back from it. And it reminds me of what Huey P. Newton said in his book, Revolutionary Suicide. And he's talking about the difference between reactionary and revolutionary. And how, you know, reactionary, of course, you just giving up on life, you take your life. But he, he, made, he, he said something that resonated with me and still. He said, it's not that we have a death wish. Mm -hmm. He said, it's, but it's that we have such a strong desire to live in peace and with human dignity that the existence without it is impossible. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at the risks these people are taking, the Kaepernicks, the Michael Bennetts, the, the Malcolm Jenkins, the, all of them, uh, you know, this is where they are. You know, they, they, they're looking at life in, in, you know, with that perspective. That you know what, man, like he said, enough is enough. At some point, I'm tired. I gotta do something. And, and I, I think if, if we, okay, we're never, all of us are never gonna be on, on that level together. But at the same time, if, if a lot of us can, you know, can really see a lot of changes being made. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked, you know, she said, and I think John Carlos said it, that man, and you, you can put anything you put your mind to. You know, back in the day, you heard about uh, Africans and natives making collective prayers for rain and all of that. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see if we can do the same to get him out of office mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. before we leave here. And you know, all the other stuff that we, we, we can get done. Let me, let me uh, say a little bit about 68. Uh, Everything he said, I could say ditto to. We had a lot of people that understood and felt exactly what we felt. But that fear factor was there. 
about if I do this, I mean, when I say fair factor, I'm talking about fair factor to the point where they make excuses about, man, I like to do it, I understand what you're saying, but I promised my church I was gonna go and win that medal. I owe it to my kids to win that medal. So that was secondary. Now, you have to ask yourself, why would it be secondary? Because they trained us from the time we was knee high to a grasshopper to go for the gold. Go for the gold, go for the gold. Now we asking you to sacrifice that gold medal, to stand up for dignity and human rights? Oh no, man, that's a big bite you want me to take. So when you sit back and you say, well, who came to your aid financially? There was no one there financially that came to your aid. And I looked at Oprah Winfrey, Oprah Winfrey wasn't nobody until we did the demonstration, then all of a sudden she started to rise. But these people that make money based on individuals that step out there, they don't come back and sneak behind the door. You know, it's the public side and the private side. They don't even come behind the private side and say, man, I understand what you did and why you did it, and I know you're going through a struggle. Let me help you. But well, let me just say this and I'm shut up. <laughs> if you sit back and you think about life, think about the fact that you were born into the world on a certain day, and everybody's happy and tickle pink that you came in. And then one day, your demise, you died. Everybody's crying and sad that you died. But you know, the day you came here, that's not even relevant. The day you died is even less relevant. But what is relevant is what you did between those two dates, okay? Long after I'm gone, my kids are gonna be able to look up, my grandkids and who and so on down the line, they're gonna look up and say, well, one thing we know that our blood stood for something and didn't fall for anything. No, you hold it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, my comment is directed to Mr. Zirin. You said earlier uh, uh, something about the college football players who didn't realize the power that they had. The problem is they don't know their, some of them don't know their history. Mm -hmm. And this goes to what Mr. Carlos was talking about. Now, I'm teaching a course next spring called Race in the Courts. I, I'm retired, but I'm coming back to teach this course. And recently, I was out recruiting and I like to include athletes in this course because I want them to know that before there was a, 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 a Lou Alcindor, there was a Harry Lou who was pelted on the court. That before there was a Tiger, you know there was a Lee Elder. Mm -hmm. That there was a Jack Johnson. That there was a Joe Lewis. That mm -hmm. before Serena and Venus, of course we all know Althea Gibson and Arthur Ashe. And they don't know these, these, these heroes mm -hmm. of our day so I encourage athletes to mm -hmm. be in my class. So I was at an event recently where I was saying to these athletes, you need to be in my class. And we talk about important uh, Supreme Court decisions like Brown versus Board of Education, but we go beyond Brown. And um, of course, history. I don't want to be in a history course. Well, yeah, you got to take this. You got to know your history. Uh, do you know Shirley Chisholm? Shirley Chisholm? Uh, do you know Adam Clayton Powell? Uh, no. Uh, well, what was really startling was I asked six athletes of color if they knew Thurgood Marshall. Six out of six said no, which means we got some work to do. Part, part, of the, so, part of the problem being that it's not taught in schools, and we talked, I don't know where I talked about this, maybe with the MSA earlier, is that for whatever reason, we're not taught our history in the schools, right? I, I built a paper mache slave ship in seventh grade because I was not taught about slavery as a kid. And it was something that my mom taught me and my dad taught me. And I don't, I mean, I, I don't find fault in these athletes for not being taught it. What I do find fault is in not seeking the knowledge yourself, you know? But that's something that I think you, lear you learn as an adult, that you have, because you're not being taught it, doesn't mean that you shouldn't seek it on your own. I, I sort of need to leave rethinking community for this day on the image of you as a seventh grader having built a paper mache <laughs> slave ship. I was watching Roots in like sixth grade. I'm, I'm really, I, there's, there's a lot happening in my mind right now and I need to leave it on that. Um, I also need to do so because it's nine o'clock at night. We started this day at 8.30 in the morning. And I mean, and tomorrow starts at like, what time, Dr. Zeisman, I mean, Dr. Not, and at eight, and that way we'll be there at nine. Yeah, I know, but I think they put on my calendar for eight because you know I'm me. Yeah, but y'all don't have to be there till nine, but they put on my calendar at eight, so I'll be there at nine. 
That said, um, for the, for the, not y'all, y'all just cover, cover your ears because it's not for y'all. For the over 21 crowd, <laughs> um, for anybody who, who, who is still awake, um, my uh, colleague and, and um, guest host, uh, Dorian Warren, and I will be uh, doing a live Freedom on Tap, which is our live event series. This is in your swag bags if you got them at the conference earlier today or if you got them at the front door. And if you didn't, I think that Director Sizemore has some of them here for you. So um, we are doing a Freedom on Tap at uh, Carolina Vineyard and Hops for folks who wanna come to that for um, older folks. No, not for y'all, y'all have to get on, get on the bus go yourselves home. You may watch it on the live stream, that's fine, but you may not come. But thank you all for coming out and you may stay and, and get photographs. But more than anything, what I wanna say is thank you. I wanna say thank you to this panel and I wanna say thank you for several things. I wanna say thank you for being at Wake Forest University tonight. I wanna say thank you for helping us to rethink community around this specific set of topics around sports and community. But more than that, I wanna say thank you for your work. I wanna say thank you for being extraordinary athletes first, because if you weren't, if you weren't committed to your gift and to cultivating that gift to being athletes, you wouldn't have the platform to use the voice to do the work. And so that you cultivated, even if you first were just like, you know, being cool and then just going out and running and then winning the gold medal. <laughs> so for being the athletes that you are, for being the persons who you are, for being the people of faith who all of you are, for being the people of history who you are, and then for being gracious enough and kind enough to share all of that with us. Thank you, genuinely, thank you.